Hey, robot assistant, did you find anything out about this dude? Yes, sir, his dead body turned up in a river a few weeks ago after- No, no, I don't care about that. I'm wondering how the hip-hopping fuck this prick did a video on Manhunt 2 for my own show before I could. No, uh, no, we couldn't find anything else about that. <sighs> well, that's just great, isn't it? I had this amazing idea where I'd cover the wall with puppy photos, and cute cartoon characters, and some other alliterative phrase meant to contrast against some dude getting his balls plucked out of his scrotum. Personally, I expected this given how long your fat ass was taking to make that video. Hey, I have a legit excuse. But, that's enough. Let's get cracking on the next game. Man, I'm really pumped up now for this one. As pumped up as the reviewers who definitely weren't paid off to give this one a perfect score. I'll show that douchebag how to make a controversy episode the right way. Here we go! Sir, you haven't slept in three weeks. What's keeping you- There'll be a Mickey around me, hearty! Shield ye eyes! Uh... Big American titties. Okay, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm cool. Uh, good news is, there's a lot more here than I expected there to be. And it's not as bad as I expected it to be either. So let's see what Rockstar North has been up to all this time. To briefly recap once again, after the massive success of GTA 3, Rockstar North milked the hell out of those Renderware-based sandbox moneymakers with Vice City and San Andreas, which were even more successful. However, they believed the series needed to evolve from this point onward if they were to continue making all the money in the world. As such, those Edinburgh Einstein started work on a new entry in the series a month after San Andreas' release, with one of the Hauser brothers stating that the biggest goal for this project was to achieve the kind of leap in technical prowess they got going from GTA 2 to 3. This was reflected in the decision to make this project the next numbered entry in the GTA series, as they had shown off themselves during E3 2006. So what I'd like to show you is my new edition. Man, that's still weird to me. And that the development process was, in his words, a complete nightmare. They'd sunk millions upon millions of dollars into it and had over a thousand people from several Rockstar Studios involved with its creation, which would finally see the company's completed shift from Criterion's darling of a game engine to an engine all of their own, the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine. Or Rage, if you're cool. I say that, but it's actually just a retooled and upgraded version of Angel Studios, aka Rockstar San Diego's own game engine, which had already seen use in games like Red Dead Revolver and Rockstar Table Tennis. With this new technology though, the team were able to create a more vast and more open game world than ever before. A world that would take place in Liberty City and be based off the Big Apple, yet again. It would also tell the story of an Eastern European immigrant named Nico looking to escape his troubled past and start over in the city of dreams. For as much as a nightmare as its creation had been, and even with a harsh six month long delay, the world would finally be gifted with the return of Rockstar's flagship series, and in a new console generation at that. So, without further ado, step forward, Grand Theft Auto. Four. Unfortunately, like with the last two Rockstar games we cover, GTA 4 had already garnered a fair amount of controversy well before its anticipated release. Most of it saw the continued fallout from the hot coffee incident, or were based on how the game was, in fact, a GTA game, and one in the HD generation of consoles at that, so the violence and sexlence would obviously be further heightened, and obviously that pissed off the usual suspects. It's all the same <laughs> Don't let your kids watch it! Kind of stuff from entities such as the Parents Television Council, Senator Leland Arms Trafficking Yeet, and of course Hillary Dillery Duck.
oh, wait, apparently she wouldn't be making a statement this time around. How telling. Perhaps the most execrable example, though. Uh, oh, no, not you, Jackie boy. I mean, we'll get to your shenanigans. But first, I gotta tell off the former New York City administration. In a press statement, NYC officials, among whom was former mayor and national how not to run a political campaign icon 6201, Michael Bloomberg, were quite angered that Rockstar would dare to portray New York City as a disgusting rat-infested hellhole filled with all the criminals, prostitutes, and seedy people of the world, and not the safe haven they've been trying to make it out to be for years. Well, I guess this meant they had no trouble with GTA 3's portrayal then. But to be fair, Rudy Giuliani was mayor at that time, and he and his team were probably too busy taking advantage of, I mean, helping the city recover from 9-11 to notice. The New York Daily News article detailing these statements also chastised Rockstar and GTA's past games for all sorts of hilariously false things. Remember the mission in Vice City where Tommy gave a dirty magazine to a young boy? I love that mission, such a nice and nuanced outlook on adolescent curiosity. Oh, wait, never mind, I'm thinking of Yakuza Zero. Maybe I got that mixed up with the old lady who hates kids and also sold drugs through ice cream vans. Come to think of it, I don't think kids actually exist in GTA. Regardless of whatever half-assed claims were made here, nothing came out of it. And get used to that phrase. Perhaps the awareness campaign the ESRB ran in preparation for the game's release, which had them go as far as to team up with a historically critical nymph, had something to do with it. Or maybe Rockstar was too preoccupied with other bullshit to even care. During this period, EA was doing its best to try to snatch up their parent company, Take-Two which added another layer on top of the several layers of stress surrounding the game's development. Yeah, I certainly would be more concerned with being kidnapped by EA than some fluff piece in the fucking New York Daily News. Pushing this nonsense under the already bulged up rug, Rockstar went and pluffed the game onto Xbox 360 and PS3 console owners in April of 2008 to wide acclaim, with many critics and players heralding it as the perfect evolution of the GTA formula. It even reached a higher aggregate score on Metacritic than 3 did, for anyone who cares about that. As for my thoughts on the game, 12 and a half years after its release, well, this time I have to forego the more critical angle I've been doing in the past few videos. This isn't to say I haven't played GTA 4, in fact I've played it several times throughout my growing years. Trouble is, I've never actually played through the whole game. My buddy and I were going through it over at the Dead LP channel, but we stopped around the time I declared said channel to be deaded, and we had just barely escaped through a third of the game. From what I recall, I certainly appreciated the grander cinematics and more polished gameplay, outside of the driving, which yes, I find just as annoying as others do. And the story and characters were interesting as well, uh, I'll be a little plotting, although that may have just been because we were fucking around it too much. See you there. Here we go. Oh, oh cops. Oh. 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 O
Speaking of which, said release saw GTA 4 selling about 3.6 million copies and gaining revenue totaling to thrice the amount of money Rockstar had put into it within 24 hours, setting a world record at the time for the fastest selling entertainment product of all time. Not just video games, in any form of entertainment. Rockstar's grip on the industry wasn't going to be shaken off by some meager pouting. So if there were to be any further controversy, it'd have to be just as massive. And boy did these fools try. So we're gonna detail each and every attempt at that, cause I need to stretch this video out so I can continue pleasing the YouTube overlords. Oh, hey, looks like that finally paid off. But actually, I'm really not that keen putting ads on these videos, cause it, it just wastes everyone's time, so... Oh. <sighs> Never mind then, just keep using those ad blockers, folks. To start with, one of the game's newest additions is how you can get Nico pissed drunk by going to one of the several in-game bars. It's not really for anything other than making the poor man harder to control, especially while driving, and the game even discourages the player from doing just that, but as per usual, the fact that you can get wasted and drive while wasted was enough for Mothers Against Drunk Driving, aka Mads, to have a go at Rockstar and Friends. In fact, they were so mad they demanded the ESRB change the game's rating to AO based on this feature alone, stating, Drunk driving is not a game, and it is not a joke. Ah. Uh, oh god. <laughs> this is... <laughs> This is fun. Oh, there's cop, there's cop, there's cop, there's cop, two cops, multiple cops. Ah! Ah! Going on the road! Jesus Christ. Anyway, Rockstar declined to honor Matt's request, as well as their other request to halt sales of the fastest selling piece of entertainment in history, circa 2008, until this was fixed. Very smart people these are. And it gets worse. Political commentator Glenn Beck ran a piece about the game on HLN News a few days after its release. As you can immediately tell, he didn't have a whole lot of nice things to say about it. I tried to watch the whole thing, but... We are training our kids to be killers. I stopped right here. According to the articles covering this thought-provoking diatribe, he went on to describe how the military would use simulation software very similar to video games in order to train their soldiers for warfare, and that without them, these soldiers would be completely frail on the battlefield. So putting games like these in the hands of children is... Training our kids to be killers. Well, yeah. It's an argument parroted by many folk like Beck, and arguably popularized by Sir Dave Grossman, a likely unfamiliar person to most of y'all, but is a person who spent the last two decades trying to convince our society that violent entertainment is training our kids to be killers, sirs, sirs. especially violent video games, which he constantly, constantly refers to as murder simulators. Yeah, you thought Florida Man was behind that term this whole time, didn't you? This is a whole mountain of hypocritical nonsense that crops up every now and then to do nothing more than cause extremely unnecessary bullshit. Don't let our young, impressionable kids play this crap or else they might do something stupid, like, I don't know, join the army. <sighs> Speaking of Florida Man... ...grassroots director for the Parents Television Council and Jack... Thompson. We already detailed the whole RICO lawsuit the dude tried to pull, so now with the settlement between him and Take-Two in place, thus limiting his options even further, what could Mr. Jack Thompson do now? Well, once again, more than I expected. He balked at one of the mini games previews. This one in particular featured in Game Informer, apparently showing off one of the first missions in the game, where Nico has to take out a lawyer supposedly causing some kind of trouble for other people. If this didn't sound peculiar enough, one of the lines this character would spout under the threat of death was... Yep. The obvious similarities were so pointed to him that Thompson threatened to block the game's release if this character and the mission itself weren't removed from the final product. Now this actually sounds a bit more credible than his usual claims, even if by making this threat he also kind of violates the agreement he'd made. But upon closer inspection of the final product, which did feature the mission anyway, his little narrative crumbles apart. 
First off, said mission, titled Final Interview, is actually quite a way into the game. And the soon-to-be-dead lawyer is ordered to be dead by a corrupt cop who believes that this lawyer has evidence of corruption against them. The lawyer himself is also far different in terms of personality when compared to that in Mr. Thompson. Or at least the kind Mr. Pearl Harbor 2 portrays himself as. It is true that the line used as the smoking gun for his case did end up in the game too, but it's more of a cheeky jab at Thompson than anything else. Hell, there are far worse jabs at real life figures throughout the game. Just take a look at the Statue of Liberty. Uh, oh, sorry, the Statue of Happiness. Not exactly as subtle, is it? In the end, Thompson didn't do anything there, but he had more tricks up his sleeve. As he was apt to do by then, he sent out an electronic letter to someone at Take Two. Specifically, the newest and current CEO of the company, Strauss Zelnick's mother. And no, I'm not joking, that's who the email was addressed to. It contained the usual bombastic soliloquies from the mad lad, with the highlights being the continued accusations that Zelnick was indirectly responsible for the Devon Moore murders, even though he was appointed CEO well after that. Probably should be saying that to the other guy, but just nitpicking here. And other unprovoked attacks on Zelnick, saying how he may as well have been part of the Hitler Youth and should have received a Ted Bundy merit badge. Stemming from how Zelnick was a Boy Scout growing up. Wow, damn shot here, okay. Of course, this wasn't directly sent to Zelnick's mother, rather his lawyer, who I guess Thompson expected to relay to his mother. Well, I think that's completely reasonable. I, I don't see why they wouldn't fall through. So with that being a complete bust too, Thompson then moved on to what I'm calling his last hurrah, his last big dick move, or death rattle. I don't know, they're interchangeable in my eyes, take your pick. He submitted a complaint to the Miami-Dade Transit regarding advertisements for the game being placed over several bus shelters across the county, to which they complied. So yet another failure for J- Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, yeah, the MDT went and removed those ads in response to Mr. Thompson's complaint. And according to the Game Politics interview with the organization, it was the only complaint they had received about them. Certainly a bold move, but if you've been watching the series up to this point, it's not exactly surprising. This ain't the county's first brush with GTA. Perhaps he had the home field advantage. At least that's how I'm gonna interpret it. For all I know, Thompson was blowing up their office phones in a desperate attempt at some retribution, and this was done to shut him up. The bigger problem here is that Take Two had more than enough ground to litigate the MDT into oblivion because they were in the middle of doing just that with the Chicago Transit Authority, who had also pulled GTA 4 ads for similarly vague reasons, although not due to Mr. Thompson, rather thanks to some dumb Fox News piece. What's the difference, am I right? Take Two sued in response not merely because of the ad's removal, but because the removal violated a 300 grand contract that they had with the CTA. So we're on many levels of stupidity here, even more than J. Thompson. Uh, well, almost. But the true kicker is that at the time of filing, the CTA were going through some severe budget issues. So that margin would only get larger if this suit went through. And it did. Several months after the filing, the CTA relinquished their big ban on the GTA 4 ads, and granted Take Two six full weeks to display them on any bus shelter, bus interior, or bus bus they wanted but not before outright banning any further advertisements for violent video games. I mean, R-rated movies were still cool though, and Glorious Bastards was gonna be all over the fucking city that year. Oh, it's gonna be fucking great. Sadly, try as they may, the CTA were no match for the true power of logic, as Take Two's Big Daddy, the Entertainment Software Association, would also bring a lawsuit against this crap and also win thus setting the precedent for any future incidents of this sort and forcing the city to shift blame for their rampant crime problems onto another scapegoat. As for the Miami-Dade thing, I have no idea if they actually got their ass sued too, because I could only find speculation. In that case, I assume they either backed off on the whole thing, or they were so insignificant to take to compared to Chicago's giant gold mine, they wouldn't be worth suing at all. Which is the funnier option, so I'm gonna go with that. Alright, this is kind of fun. I've already forgot about the murder sim stuff too. So, what's up next? Oh. I had a feeling it was gonna show up. So yeah, there are some crimes linked to GTA 4. Let's start with the ones that didn't end up in murder. 
Six teens from Long Island went on a random crime spree and admitted to being inspired by GTA 4 to commit these crimes after being arrested. Some of them had prior convictions and the incident really didn't spark anything other than the best headline any of the third-rate news sites covering it would get that week. Over in the UK, some chav physically and sexually assaulted two women at nighttime, admitting to have been playing several hours of GTA 4 before doing those heinous acts. While this angle was taken into consideration by authorities, they concluded that there were more likely causes behind these actions. The judge presiding the case thought otherwise, but yet again, nothing came out of the whole affair. And the culprit would be jailed for nearly 10 years before being released into society under a new alias and getting arrested again for a similar crime not even 18 months later. At least they didn't bring up Little Lacey's surprise pageant. I'll let y'all look that up yourselves. Or better yet, don't. In much more depressing news, about half a decade after GTA 4's release, yeah, no, I'm not very consistent about the time span, but just roll with it. An incident occurred in, seriously? Slaughter, Louisiana, where an eight-year-old grabbed a loaded handgun lying around his residence and shot his elderly grandmother in the head. And of course, he was playing the game right before the shooting. Then despite authorities initially believing that the shooting wasn't accidental, they still ruled it as such considering the kid's age. This relit the violent game's discourse for a very brief period of time, and yeah, one has to wonder where the blame should lie in this case. A violent game that a child had easy access to, even though they likely shouldn't have had access to it. Or a fucking loaded handgun that a child had easy access to, even though they likely shouldn't have had access to it. I'll let y'all take your pick for this one too. But once again, nothing came out of it. So let's see an incident with actual consequences. And of course we have to go outside the US for that. Bringing the time period back to 2008, in Thailand, an 18-year-old high schooler and self-proclaimed obsessive player of GTA 4 sought to, in their words, find out if committing crimes was as easy to do in real life as it was in the game. Spoiler alert, it was. And they ended up shanking a taxi driver while trying to steal that driver's taxi. In spite of police saying the dude showed no mental issues during his confession to the crime, I highly doubt they performed this act as part of some grand social experiment. Even Sam Pepper wouldn't have attempted that. Yeah, that's a dated reference, but it's the only one I could think of. Uh, even Ross Creations wouldn't have attempted that. Look, I don't know anything about these people except for how dumb they are. This incident was so highly publicized that the biggest Thai games publisher sought to have any retailers in the kingdom stop selling GTA 4 and replace it with literally anything else effectively banning the title in the region. Kind of. Well, I mean, they did stop selling the game there, but the game we're covering in the next video is still frequently sold there without any restrictions, so... Whatever, it's stupid, but at least it's something. As for the Taxi Man Slayer, if they were to be found guilty, they'd be shanked themselves by the government, and I couldn't find out whether or not that happened, but it more than likely did, so... R.I.P. You D-U-M-B-C-U-N-T. Speaking of bannings, or censorship though, the Oceanic versions of the game caught some flack for that too. Try to follow me on this one. Initially it was reported that the game would arrive uncensored in both Australia and New Zealand, but then Rockstar went back on that, stating that there were some edits that needed to be made to get the MA-15 rating in Aussie land. These changes included cutting down on the extensive prostitution sequences to the point where they just resembled the ones in past games, and over on the violence end, removing bloody marks and blood pools entirely, as well as bullet holes on player bodies. New Zealand would also get this censored release, despite having the 18 plus rating those damn Australians were lacking at the time, until one very upset player decided to import the uncensored version of the game and submit that to the OFLC for certification rather than the current censored version, cause I guess you could just do that there. And get this, after a two month wait, the board did the unthinkable and actually granted the uncensored version, thus allowing it to be legally sold in the country. Huh, that's pretty cool. As for Australia, they would eventually get that uncensored version themselves with the PC release a few months later, despite the console version still being censored. How... fucking dumb. What else did you think I was gonna say? On the topic of PC releases though, the last bit of controversy GTA 4 got itself attached to involved that version. 
Its initial release saw players who were wanting to play what was to be the best possible version of the game be greeted with a slew of technical issues. Glitches and bugs of all sorts were abound, crashes were frequent, and of course they had to go through Game Store Windows Live in order to activate the damn thing in the first place, which was its own problem not just relegated to this specific game. This all led to numerous refund requests on Steam and Rockstar having a hell of a time trying to get it all fixed. I guess they did fine in that regard since then, as my buddy and I didn't encounter any similar issues during our playthrough. Probably because we bypassed that Games for Windows Live bullshit. <laughs> ho ho! Ho! Oh! What? What? Whoa. I, I, She's a wizard, man. You've got, you've got to do it. You've got to do it now. I've Fuck got, this guy. I've got to do her. A witch! Oh, oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. She's a witch. No. Burn the witch. Maybe there was a problem here, I can't really remember, but to my knowledge it never crashed on us. So it's at least one step above the bully PC port. However, earlier this year, over a decade after these issues had been mostly resolved, the PC version encountered another equally big problem. It had up and vanished from the Steam store. Before any rumors or conspiracy theories could be jumpstarted from this though, Rockstar were quick to admit that this was due to Microsoft ending support for the whole Games for Windows Live thing. And if it were still entangled with the game, it eventually stopped generating keys and be impossible for new players to activate it. Not sure why it took them almost six years for them to do so, but... Whatever. About a few months later, the game arrived back onto Steam, sans that cancerous client, as well as Rockstar's own digital distribution platform. Unfortunately, removing the client made accessing multiplayer near impossible. Not quite the best trade-off, I presume. At least it's still there in the unpatched version, and in the consoles as well. Though it's probably just a matter of time before it's all completely disabled. I'm surprised it's lasted this long anyway, considering how big a cash cow GT Online is, but we'll get to that later. And that about wraps it up. At least I'm pretty sure it does. The only other notable thing is the exposed dick one could see in the game's DLC, The Lost and Damned, but that was just common sense media on a very slow and horny news day. It's just a dick. It's not a big deal. Nowadays, GTA 4 appears to not be as highly praised as it had been by so many folks, as it's still a good game in its own right, and a stepping stone towards the most successful game Rockstar would, and likely will, ever make. Controversy-wise, it had a lot going on, some of it dumb and pointless, some of it funny and pointless, none of it ever reaching the heights of boiling cup of joe, but I could at least get worked up about it enough to kinda care. I haven't even mentioned the best thing to come out of it, too. In late 2008, the Florida Supreme Court approved a recommendation made earlier that year to strip away the power to practice law from one Sir Jack Thompson resulting in his permanent disbarment within the state. Oh, he tried to fight back, submitting a countersuit almost immediately afterwards and saying he would continue to practice law regardless of the ruling, yet they were merely the loud cries of a sore loser who had never regained the power he once used to cause so many unnecessary headaches and crises. A fitting end to the era of inflammatory rhetoric he was so well known for. I hope. Also, this had nothing to do with GTA 4, it just happened around the same time, but I like to think that it did, so fuck it. Six Bigger Man Kidditties out of ten. Wow, what a totally original joke to end on. You sure are the comedy prince, your highness. You know, Robot Assistant, in times like this, I would prefer some sort of support rather than sarcasm and scorn. And I would prefer if you stopped using alliterations because it's actually annoying, you asshole. Well, pardon me, but I prefer if you'd please prohibit pronouncing such proclamations at your prince, as you pettily put it, you petulant prick. And I wish you'd shut the fuck up and kill yourself. Well, maybe I will then. Okay, do it, bitch. Fine, here goes. Ah, <laughs> uh, jeez, what happened? You shot yourself in the hand and the immortal ass revived you as he's been doing this whole series. What the hell are you talking about? Hey! Hey! Someone uploaded a GTA 4 video before I could! Oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh shit, Martha's dead? Good.